everyone. Glad to be back here with you once again. I hope you had a wonderful feast. Uh, uh, my heart goes out to all those <clears throat> that suffered through the feast this year with the coronavirus. I know I did, and uh, I am recovered fully, and I'm glad to say so. I got out and mowed my yard yesterday, and then I got on my tractor and rode it for about an hour and mowed the side pasture there and made everything look nice and clean and and uh, feels good to be back in the saddle, as they say again, and uh, back at work. And uh, the folks at work were glad to see me back because, you know, when you go back to work after missing a, a good bit of time, the work doesn't cease. It just keeps right on going. And when you get back, you, you have to catch up, don't you? And uh, so that's what I've been doing for the last week and uh, worked from home for one week. But this week was able to get out and uh, be with the guys and uh, start – Making some oil again. It's eighty dollars a barrel down. The price of natural gas is five fifty. One of the hands said, "Is it going to be busy next year?" I said, "Well, if this price stays up as high as it is right now, I'm sure that it will be." Uh, I know that you don't appreciate that at the gas pump, but it is certainly helping the oil and gas industry right now. What is your greatest asset? You know, or your greatest tool that you have, you know, carpenters have their favorite hammer or they have their favorite tool that they use. Mechanics might even have their, you know, if you ever go into a mechanic shop and see some of their toolboxes, they have $10,000, $20,000 worth of tools there in that big giant box that they roll around. They have to to work on these modern cars with their technology and their electronics now. But they have their favorite set of tools or favorite wrench that they grab. Maybe an artist or somebody that does crafts has their favorite paintbrush or what it might be. As a Christian, what is your favorite asset? What are your favorite tools as a Christian? And of course, I'm referring to your Christian qualities, not a tool in specific. What quality do you like to see in other Christians? You know, when you visit some folks, and I was very thankful that I was around some Christians this last month when I was on my way back from the feast this year, and I was able to stay with some friends, and they did a very good job of taking care of us, Judy and I, and I owe them a great deal of gratitude and thanks for that. But I won't embarrass them, but I wanted to let them know that, you know, Christian qualities come in a in a wide array of, of ways and, and of expressing, you know, your Christian love and your Christian uh, attitude toward other Christians. You might say, well, I really have never looked at my own Christian qualities. I don't really like to do that anyway. It's sort of embarrassing. It's kind of like looking into a mirror, you know. You, some people like, uh, I comb my hair, brush my teeth, and get away from the mirror. I mean, I don't really care to sit there in front of that mirror for very long. But we see evidence of Christian qualities in other people that's quite remarkable, don't we? We say that person really does have a, you know, a robust attitude or they got a real loving, caring attitude. Their, their nature, they're, they're gentle, they're forgiving or they're kind or, they're, or they help other people or they always, you know, uh, embracing other people and, and making them feel wonderful. The Bible says in the book of Proverbs is iron sharpens iron. We desire to possess those same qualities, don't we? Sometimes we're sort of put in our place when we see other Christians and how they are towards other people. And you think, man, I've got a long way to go. I've got a lot of work to do in being a really stand-up Christian, uh, don't we? If someone were to describe you, what would they say? I had an interview some years ago where I had a sort of a, you know, one of these employment, you know, where they, they evaluate you and you hear what other people have to say or write about what kind of character you have, what kind of person you are. It's a little embarrassing to read what other people have to say about you, but you might be surprised. How would they describe you? When we look at our own Christian, for lack of term, toolbox, our own Christian qualities, what is your greatest asset, would you say? What great Christ Christian quality do I have or do we have? It's sort of, as I said, a little embarrassing to look at it. I believe the Bible speaks of a lot of different qualities that we're to possess, but one 
really seems to stand out, and I believe that it is like the theme or maybe the thread that runs through Scripture and through the Bible. In Proverbs, the 19th chapter, I'd like to turn there in verse 11. Let's start here in Proverbs, the 19th chapter, down in verse 11. It says, the discretion of a man defers his anger, and it is his glory to pass over a transgression. I think it's really interesting that he used the word pass over there, don't you? After all, what does the word Passover mean to us? It is his glory to pass over a transgression. Passover, a transgression. Oh, now that's never happened to me or to you, has it? But I get so aggravated at people at times. You ever say that? I almost say that every day. Judy has to listen to me blow off some steam when I come home from work. And this guy did that, and those people did this, and they did this. And then finally I'll go, okay, I'll sigh, and I'll go, okay, I'm over it. You know, I just get so aggravated at people. People aggravate me. I hate to say that. I try to have a Christian attitude. I try to have compassion, and I try to have patience. But people never seem to amaze me at what they will try to get away with, what lies they will tell, what actions they will do, what they will say about someone else. It blows me away. And uh, how are we to act towards those who trespass against us? You know, where we see this scripture that says it's the glory of a man to pass over a transgression. You know, in James, the first chapter, you don't have to turn there, I'll quote you. It says, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. For the wrath of man works not the righteousness of God. You know the old saying, they always say it worked. You have two of these and one of these. There's a reason for that. You should be listening twice as much and speaking half as much. I think that's a great analogy and uh, because some people love to talk. They love to hear themselves talk, and they love to justify themselves. You know, it's, you know, when you learn about Christian living, you begin to learn about human nature and how the heart of man, you know, people say, well, man, in my heart of hearts, I believe that that's what I need to do. And you know, as a Christian, the Bible says that the heart is is wicked, desperately wicked, that the heart is deceitful above all things, that you can't trust your own heart. You have to depend on God's word, what God says, not your own feelings, your own thoughts, and your own heart. But people out there in the world, they're completely oblivious to that. They think, if I feel it, that it's got to be right. And that's not necessarily true, is it? Proverbs 24, over just a page or two here, in verse 16 Proverbs 24, down in verse 16, uh, he says, For a just man falls seven times. I, read, I, read, I wanted to read into what this scripture that I'm about to read here with this one because Christians fall very often throughout their walk, don't they? The good part about it is we don't stay on the ground. Just like David when he was down there on the ground and he wouldn't eat because he wanted God to save that child, and finally the child died, at some point he had to get up off the ground, didn't he? It says the just man falls seven times and rises up again, but the wicked shall fall into mischief. Permanent destruction, in other words. Rejoice not when your enemy falls, and let not your heart be glad when he stumbles. That's real easy to do. In our human nature, isn't it? When you see some guy whiz by you in a car and he's weaving out of traffic, we saw one on the way to church this morning, and then you get up the road and he's had an accident. It's real easy to go, aha, he got exactly what he deserved. Lest the Lord see it and it displease him and he turn away his wrath from him, fret not yourself because of evil men, Neither be thou envious of the wicked, 
For there shall be no reward to an evil man. The candle of the wicked shall be put out. There are so many scriptures there about God's wrath, isn't it? You know, in Hebrews, the second chapter, it says, For the word spoken by, if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, listen to this now, the writer of Hebrews, he's asking you, what if God gave everybody what they deserve? He's sort of putting, paraphrasing this. He says, For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward, and then you know the rest of it, how shall we escape so great salvation? We would never make it, would we? If God exacted judgment on us instantaneously and immediately for the sins that we've committed, we need Forgiveness, don't we? We need it. Proverbs 25 and verse 21, over just another page here. If your enemy be hungry, give him bread to eat. If he be thirsty, give him water to drink. For you shall heap coals of fire upon his head, and the Lord shall reward you. Why do that to your enemy? My margin says here, I'm going to just read what it says. It does not refer to revenge or punishment like taking actual coals of fire and pouring them on them as revenge, but to the, but the pangs of shame that will lead to reconciliation. He will be so embarrassed by what happened and realize who it was that took care of him, <coughs> excuse me, that he will reconcile or repent. I wrote here, do you remember the story of the Good Samaritan? You remember how the guy fell on bad times? He was beaten up and they robbed him and he was left there bleeding, probably unconscious. And it was not the priest that came by. It wasn't the Levite that came by. It was who? It was the person everybody thought was the lowest class person on earth, the rotten Samaritan out here, that actually stopped and helped this guy. Now we read that story time and time again. And we've, we thought, yeah... <clears throat> the poor old guy, he got saved by the, by the Samaritan. The Samaritan actually picked him up, carried him to a hotel, said, keep him here a couple of days, whatever he, you know, if he stays longer, well, next time I'm by, I will pay the rest. What a great example. But Jesus went on to ask those people that he was telling this story to, <clears throat> excuse me, who was it that showed him the greatest kindness? And, of course, they said, well, the Samaritan. And he said, you've judged right then. But do you ever think about the guy that was attacked? Have you ever thought about it from his perspective? Do you think that he would have ever given the Samaritan the time of day when he was well? Do you think he'd ever looked at the Samaritan <coughs> when he, before he got attacked? How did he feel when he was laying there in the hotel room recovering and realizing that it was the Samaritan that had healed him and brought him into the, into the hotel. So that leads me to the next analogy here, and I think this may be what Jesus was actually trying to tell these people. How will people feel when learning that the son of David, the Hebrew, the Jew, the Son of Man, this Jesus, is responsible for their salvation. How do you think people are going to feel? I think it's quite an analogy in my opinion. What did God say about vengeance? I wanted to turn back. The original quote here is in Deuteronomy, the 32nd chapter. Paul quoted this as some of the other writers did in the Bible but it, I want to go to the original part of this. It's Deuteronomy, the 32nd chapter, down in verse 35, because I think there's a little bit more meat here from the original person who wrote it, and who was Moses, when he wrote sort of a song. They call it a song here that he gave to the people of Israel. He says, of course, he makes this lengthy condemnation against Israel, and he said, I know that while I'm here, you rebelled against God time after time and time again. I know that after I'm gone, you're going to turn away from God in the latter times. 
He even talks about our day when we're going to turn completely away from God. And God is going to send enemies within our midst. He's going to send plagues. He's going to send war. He's going to punish us. But he is not going to forget his mercy and his love for Israel. That promise is there. He said, and, and because he would turn the nation of Israel over to these enemies, these enemies would stand up in pride and say, it is we that did this, not God. And God said, be careful. I gave Israel into your hand to punish them. You're still responsible for your actions. And therefore, he says, verse 35, to me belongs vengeance and recompense. Their foot shall slide in due time. Talking about those enemies that would come in and chastise Israel. For the day of their calamity is at hand and the things that shall come upon them make haste. Their destruction is coming. For I, the Lord, shall judge his people and repent himself for his servants. In other words, have compassion on Israel after he's punished them. When he sees that their power is gone and there's none shut up or left. So God says that vengeance belongs to him. We're not to be the ones that carry out acts of vengeance upon other people, destruction upon other people, and be judge, jury, and executioner all at once. There are plenty of scriptures, I believe, that speak of God's wrath upon the wickedness of this world. When God will eventually repay, he says over and over again, I will repay. There is coming a time when I'm going to settle all the differences, and it's not our job. Romans, in the book of Romans, Paul put it a similar way. I want to go back to uh, Romans, the 12th chapter. Romans 12, <clears throat> excuse me. Romans, the 12th chapter, in verse 17. He says, recompense to no man evil for evil. We're not to take matters into our own hands. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. If it be possible, as much as lies within you, live peaceably with all men. That's difficult to do, isn't it, sometimes? He said, dearly beloved, avenge not yourself, but rather give place under wrath, but rather give place under wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay. He's quoting the same scripture that we read here. Therefore, if your enemy be hungry, feed him. We read that's Proverbs here too. If he's thirsty, give him drink, for in doing so you will heap coals of fire upon his head. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. I think we live in a world today where a lot of people feel overcome with evil. We feel like it's the only way that we can survive is to retaliate. And God is saying, I've got this. I'm keeping record of all the evil that is being done. I know all the secret deals. I know all of the chicanery and all of the wickedness that man has done. And I'm keeping track of it. Your responsibility is to remain faithful and remain righteous and to stay steadfast, in other words. Uh, do our actions affect our relationship with God, the way we react? Of course, you know this. Matthew, the fifth chapter. I'm going to go over here, Matthew 5. <clears throat> Matthew 5, down to verse 21. You've heard it said that you, of old, you shall not kill, and whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. But I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whosoever say to his brother, Raka, are you idiot, are you fool, are you empty you know, knucklehead or whatever, shall be in danger of the council. But whosoever shall say you fool shall be in danger of Gehenna fire. Therefore, here's the point I wanted to make. If you bring your gift to the altar... My, my margin made an interesting statement here. It said, one who would attempt to buy off his conscience by giving something to God. I think I'll go to church today or go to the temple in the case of the folks here. Make an offering today because my conscience is really bothering me about something that I did. And while he's there giving his gift to God, he remembers that his brother had something against him. 
Now, what does the Bible say in that situation there? Well, Jesus answers it. Leave your gift there at the altar and go your way. Remember, they're coming to the temple to make an offering to God. Go your way. First, be reconciled with your brother and then come and offer your gift. It almost has seemed to say that, yes, our actions do affect our relationship with God because it seems to indicate that your gift won't be accepted if you still have this animosity out there, hanging out there that you've not dealt with. You remember in Ephesians 4, chapter, it says, let not the sun go down on your wrath. Don't let that sun set until you apologize, until you say, forgive me, I was wrong, whatever. Paul said on a number of occasions, it doesn't matter really who was wrong, does he? Why wouldn't you just go ahead and set, accept the wrong so that you can reconcile with your brother? Even in occasions where the people in the church were going at, to, to lawyers and suing one another, he said, why not accept the wrong? Let, let yourself be default, defrauded. So what? To hold and have peace within the church is more important than whatever you're going to get out of that, you know, whatever you're going to acquire. You know, our courtrooms are full of lawsuits who people are out there trying to avenge themselves, and they want that guy to get exactly what's coming to him, and they want to see him hurt and, and see him lose his business, and they want to get rich out of the, they want to be re recompensed for it. And Paul is sort of addressing that on a number of occasions. Over here page in, in the book of Matthew, the 6th chapter, verse 12. This is the famous prayer that you hear in all the movies. We, <laughs> I, I get so tickled, you know, when I went to my 40, the class reunion here some years ago, <clears throat> 2019, I think it was. You know, they had this, one of the, they had about, we had about three preachers there out of my, my classroom. I was one of them. Of course, most of the people there didn't know that I was a, a, a minister. But there's several preachers there, including several women that are preachers. And they had this guy get up and give a benediction. You know, he had to get up and say a prayer, and it was, guess what? The Lord's Prayer. You said it. Just like all the old movies that you see where when they get together and they finally realize, you know what, maybe it'd be a good idea to pray to God, our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Like, and in the room, mumble. And some people didn't know the words, you know, and you kind of, they feel kind of embarrassed. So there's this low rumble. <clears throat> in this sample prayer that Jesus gave here, he says, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Boy, you can read over that awful quickly, can't you, and realize that the way you forgive is the way God forgives you. That's justice, isn't it? But boy, do we not like it. Yes, he says, as we forgive. And what is the implication? If we don't forgive, God doesn't forgive us. It's almost like axiomatic, you know. We have to forgive and we also desperately need forgiveness every day, don't we? Are there certain circumstances where you just simply cannot forgive? I'm not able to forgive. Matthew, the 18th chapter. Another golden opportunity for Jesus here to explain to his disciples. Matthew, the 18th chapter, verse 21. And Peter said unto him, Lord, how many times... How, shall, uh, how oft shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Seven times? That's pretty generous, isn't it? Seven times a guy comes at you and trespasses against you. And Jesus said, I say unto you until 70, until seven times, uh, until seven times, but until 70 times seven. So, you know, there's seven times as many as Peter thought that it would be, that it would happen. And that's the forgiveness that we're to have for one another and of course he goes on to give him the parable he says therefore uh therefore is the kingdom of heaven likened to a certain man which is which would take account of his servants and when we begun to reckon one was brought unto him which owed him ten thousand talents 
But for as much as he had not to pay, the Lord commanded him to be sold and his wife and children and all that he had and the payment to be made. And a servant fell, up, fell down and worshipped him, saying, Lord, have patience with me and I will repay you all. And then the Lord said to that servant, he was moved with compassion and he loosed him and he forgave him the debt. You think the guy wasn't happy? I liken this to the human being that's out here in the world and he finally comes to his senses after all the events that take place in his life. He's tried it his own way and he finally realizes, I need forgiveness from God. And he goes in and he gets down on his knees and he cries buckets of tears and he says, God, please forgive me. And God gladly forgives that person. But look what happens. And the same servant went out and found one of his fellow servants which owed him a hundred pence, just a little bit of money. And he laid his hands on him and took him by the throat. And he said, pay me what you owe me. And his fellow servant fell down at his feet and besought him and did the same thing, asked for the same sort of leniency. And he would not, but he went and cast him into prison till he paid his debt. So he threw him in jail. So when the fellow servants saw what was done, they were very sorry. And he came and told unto his Lord what was done in the Lord. This is the guy that had forgiven him all of this money. He called him in and he said, you wicked servant, I forgave you all your debt because you desired me. Should not also, you should not have, shouldn't you have had compassion on your fellow servant, even as I had pity on you? And the Lord was wroth and delivered him to the tormentors till he paid all that was due him. So all of those things that he had forgiven were laid back on his shoulders again. And he said, so likewise shall my heavenly father do also unto you, if you from your heart forgive not every one his brother their trespass. I don't know how to make it any clearer than Jesus did here in his own words about forgiveness. I guess it sort of boils down to how much were we forgiven. You know, I'm reminded of that story about the woman who was caught in the act of adultery and Jesus said, let you... Let those that are among you that are without sin be the first to cast the stone at her. I guess that struck a deep chord with those folks and they realized what God had forgiven them in their lives compared to what they were accusing her and they, from oldest to youngest, filed out one by one and they all left her there with Jesus. We may not know the whole story of what's going on with somebody's life. You know, when you look at people's lives, some people have a lot of drama in their lives. And sometimes it's not their fault. They, some people grew up without a family. Some have suffered the loss of loved ones. Some are going through bankruptcy, a lack of job, a lack of income. Some are suffering from very difficult health issues and struggling maybe with terrible problems or even divorce. I was talking to this lady at work the other day, and I, I enjoy her company. She's 70-something years old. And I said, how's, how's the old man just joking around with her? And she said, Stan, we got a divorce. It was final in August. And I said, I feel like a clod. I didn't even know anything about it. She said, that's because I didn't tell you. I've not really told anyone. Here's somebody who's been married 43 years, got a divorce. I knew there was something going on, but you never know what's going on behind closed doors, do you? And what's going on in people's lives? Very, very sad. I was depressed over this for a couple of days. I just, you know, it's like one of those things that you expect to be rock solid, and all of a sudden it just vanishes. And I'm wondering what other, what else is there to hang on to? that's solid where is there a pillar a post a rock a foundation that i can cling to that's not going to be washed away by this evil world <clears throat> jesus uh, john jesus said in the book of john judge not according to appearance but judge righteous judgment 
And in Isaiah, the 11th chapter, I'll just quote this one for you for lack of time. Remember, it talks about Jesus and his coming, and it says, He shall not judge after the sight of his eyes, nor reprove after the hearing of his ears, but with righteousness shall he judge the poor and reprove with equity the meek of the earth. And Paul said, Judge nothing before the time. I want to go there and read that because he says something else there. 1 Corinthians, the fourth chapter. In verse 5, judge nothing before the time until the Lord come, who both will bring to light the hidden things of darkness and will make manifest the counsels of the heart, and then shall every man have praise of God. Like I said, he's going to open it up until everybody can see the secret deals. There won't be any hiding it by the media or hiding it behind lawyers when somebody gets lawyered up, when they've done something so heinous it costs the lives of human beings, that causes agony and misery among our populace. These schools, I tell you, if they fall victim to what is going on in our country and in our government, our kids are going to turn out a generation of people that absolutely do not know how to function in this world. And it's going to be rather sad when that generation comes to fruition. When they mature, they're going to be totally oblivious to God's laws and God's way of life. And it's going to be, it's going to, we're going to pay a heavy, heavy price. How can we acquire these wonderful traits? Maybe we could skip a couple of verses here and go to Ephesians, the fourth chapter. Ephesians 4 and verse 30. I had several other scriptures here I wanted to read you, but... <clears throat> Ephesians 4 and verse 30. For we are members of his body and... uh, I'm in the wrong chapter. Excuse me. Ephesians 4, down in verse 30. Make sure I get the right scripture here. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed unto the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you among you with all malice... And be you kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. He's making that comparison, Paul is. He's saying, remember what you were forgiven, and with the same measure, meet it out to other people. I'm about to finish up here. Uh, He says on another occasion, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Uh, Maybe one more here, Colossians, the third chapter, since we're close here. Colossians 3 and verse 12. Colossians 3 and verse 12. These are Christian virtues here. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercy, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another, and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, also do you. There it is again. And above all things, put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. Perfectness. There's that old word, charity, again. Reminds me of what? 1 Corinthians, the 13th chapter, it does not behave itself unseemly, seeks not her own, it is not easily provoked, it thinks no evil, rejoices not in iniquity, but rejoices in truth. It bears all things, it believes all things, it hopes all things, and it endures all things. Charity never fails. Paul, uh, Peter, later on in his, one of his letters, he said, you know, love covers a multitude of sins. I guess what the world needs now, as the old song used to say, is love, sweet love. But I believe now more than ever, it needs the ability to forgive. Oh, there's plenty of accusations flying around and plenty of blaming and pointing of fingers. As I said, the courtrooms are filled with lawsuits of every kind. For the simplest infractions a lot of times, why do you not suffer, as Paul said, and just take the infraction and be defrauded? 
all the while we're have, we have all these lawsuits going on, the word forgive is simply not in our vocabulary. But it should be one of our greatest assets. It is through forgiveness that we stand here today. We should be a people more willing to recognize our own shortcomings and eager to forgive the mistakes of others. For this is in the heart of God and the reason for the sacrifice of Christ. And one of the most coveted uh, qualities of a Christian. How else shall we stand in that day unless Jesus has said to each of us these words, Son, be of good cheer. Your sins be forgiven you.